This is Free Speech Radio News for Thursday, November 24, 2011. In Los Angeles, I'm Doreen Marina. Each year at Thanksgiving, many Americans celebrate food, family, and the history of the United States. But for indigenous people, their land and sacred places continue to be threatened by American colonization. In this Thanksgiving documentary, George Lavender takes us to Lake County, California, and the site of an ongoing campaign to protect Rattlesnake Island. It's a place sacred to the Elam tribe and a current struggle in 500 years of indigenous resistance. Please stay with us. A sign on the main highway reads, Welcome to beautiful Clear Lake. This is Lake County, California. The hillsides are covered with vineyards and tourist resorts have sprung up all around Clear Lake. A little way from the main highway is the Elam Indian Colony, a small collection of houses, and at its center, a traditional wooden roundhouse for ceremonies. About 80 people live here, among them Sharon Brown and Geraldine Johnson. Their grandchildren play on the same ground that they grew up on. It's a nice place to live. It's uh, really beautiful, you know, and nice and quiet at night in the evening, the kids are playing. And I, I think just because it's our home and we feel attracted, you know, just want to be here, you know, I'd rather, a lot of times I stay here, I don't even go to the store. And sometimes I'll go over and I'll say, when did this happen? Like they're fixing the road, you know. And they say, well, geez, Grandma, if you'd come out of the, get off of the res, you'd see things are moving along, but... I don't know, I just feel content, happy, I just feel safe, mm-hmm. safe here. And Well, I think it's the thing, too, that Indians have land. They, you know, it's the thing, you have a land base, and you always know you have a home to come to. You always know you have a place to stay. And then, like, when we go out, like me, we go out and we live in the city and we live all of that. And then when we get older, we think, you know, we're going to come back. And it's just, like I said, the land thing for the Indian people. And it's like, well, if you Indian, you don't have any land, where do you belong? Elam is the only tribe in Lake County which remains on its original village site. Like many California Indians, the surrounding tribes were either exterminated or forcibly displaced by white settlers into rancherias away from their traditional homelands. Lake County archaeologist John Parker has been studying the history of the area for more than 40 years. Based on the archaeological research that I've done, The Elim community has existed where it currently is for 14,000 years. But the community here has seen its land base shrink in the last century. All that remains now is about 50 acres beside the lake. White dirt and yellow rocks on either side of the road leading into the reservation are leftover mine tailings from a former mercury mine. Mining stopped in the 1950s, but left behind a toxic legacy. Mercury from the mine has contaminated the surrounding land and water, damaging not just the health of the community, but their traditional culture as well. They literally lived on the water. Their political centers were on the islands, and the water, the resources in the lake were their primary resources. Boats were everywhere, and um, the islands, actually, these political centers, were considered communal territory. All the villagers could use. Until very recently, the Elam continued to hunt and fish on the lake and gather plants along the lakeshore. There are few boats at Elam today, and no one from the community has fished since the 70s, when it became clear that mercury in the fish was making people sick. Just a few hundred feet from the shore of the reservation is Rattlesnake Island, the ancient cultural and political centre of the Elam tribe. I'm uh, Marvin Brown, and I've lived here probably since I was in third grade, and 66 right now. Probably lived here more than anybody here right now because they all left at some point. That I just heard from my dad that uh, uh, one day they said the Indians can't own the island. But talking with my dad, who lived here and his grandpa forever, you know, uh, they used to walk across. This was the same part of Elam. And it was called Elam Mudan. It, Together, you know, Mudan was the island, Elam was here. This is a story I heard, you know, but most of the stories aren't written of <laughs> what we know. You know. Sharon Brown, Marvin's sister, recalls first hearing that the island, on paper, did not belong to the tribe. In our heart, my heart, is that I've always known that belonged to the Indians. 
We always swam over there. We always played around over there. We ate tulies, and and it just seemed like, oh, we could go over there because it's ours, you know, and it's such a big change when you say, well, that's not your island, and someone's moving over there, and you think, mm-hmm. what? After all these years, they just want to take everything, take everything. The island is a sacred place for the Elam, as Sharon's niece Rose explains. I think the island is is the center center of our spirituality. Um, for me, I would say you know my ancestors are buried there. You know they're in they're in the ground, and as a native woman, when I pass, I, I plan to be my ashes to be spread on that island as well. And and that's just a part of our belief to to cross over and be with our ancestors. Um, the native women here are a big part of um, the ceremonies and the preparation and. Um, there's a lot that we don't really <laughs> tell that goes into it, but women are um, the backbone of our societies. And I believe when the island was taken, it really did disempower us as, as women. On paper, the island is currently owned by businessman John Nady. Nady made millions in the music industry in the 1970s, selling microphones to some of the biggest acts of the time. He bought the island in 2004, reportedly for $2.5 million. Since then, he has been attempting to build a vacation home and caretaker's cabin on the island, just yards from the shore of the reservation, where each morning Jim Brown goes to pray. Uh, It's a blessing uh, asking for the healing for all, all people and the earth. Like his father and grandfather before him, Jim Brown is a traditional cultural leader of the Elam tribe. This right here is our sacred landscape. The mountain, the hills with our tobacco, and our homelands right there, Rattlesnake Island. And so here, there's a home built right there. Um, that's really, it's gone. It will never come back to us, the sacredness of it. And just the sanctity of the way that uh, island sits um, without anything, you know, without home on it, it, uh, it, I think that's the hard thing for many people here to take if that's going to happen. And I know we're going to do the best we can to prevent that. And it, it, it's really the last sanctuary of our nation. Much of Elam's cultural landscape was promised to the tribe under a treaty with the American government. But the government broke its promise. In 1851, 18 treaties were signed with tribes across California, which would have left them 8.5 million acres of land. Under the treaty, much of the Clear Lake Basin would have become a reservation. But Congress refused to ratify any of the treaties with California Indians, a decision the tribes didn't hear about until more than 50 years later. Meanwhile, all across California, tribal land, including Rattlesnake Island, was claimed by settlers. They illegally gave a patent to land that they had no right to because of the federal laws that restricted it. Uh, it what it said was that you cannot pre-exempt Indian land without the Congress coming in and making either treaties or terminating the rights of those people. None of that was done in the state of California. Before John Nady bought Rattlesnake Island, ownership of the island had changed hands several times. It was first claimed in 1877 by two property speculators from San Francisco, 
who had been acquiring land throughout Lake County using the Homestead Act. Here's a guy who is involved in real estate, and he files like he's a, you know, single pioneer adult who needs land, you know. Well, he's an entrepreneur from uh, San Francisco. Homestead was supposed to be, you're going to build your house, you're going to maintain a farm or whatever, you're going to live there the rest of your life. Not, this is my vacation home or this is my real estate property. Plus, it shows in there you couldn't own a certain amount of land, you couldn't have a certain amount of wealth to even apply for the Homestead Act. This guy had it all. He had the wealth, he had everything. And again, see that right there, uh, because of his wealth and his connection to the judges, gave him a free path to uh, defraud us out of our land. Jim's son, Betsulwin, grew up on Elam, learning about the history of the tribe from his elders. Uh, I'm not saying all, all the settler families that came here, but a good majority, you know, came and acquired their land by outright killing of the Indian people here. And um, like I say, if you look into the Homestead Act, you know, looks as long as there was no Native people occupying the land, you could claim it. And and uh, unfortunately, a lot of them took to their guns and, and killed off my ancestors so they can say nobody's living here. But, you know, I think pretty much, you know, the the number of archaeological sites that, you know, dot this county, you know, they're, they tell the story of, of a great number of people being here. While the genocide against indigenous people in California is less well known than in other parts of the country, it is no less brutal. The names of towns and places in Lake County still tell part of that story. Not far from Elam, there is a small memorial beside the highway commemorating one of the many atrocities that took place. As many as 200 people were killed in 1850 by American soldiers on an island in Clear Lake, now known as Bloody Island. Every one of these towns sits on top of a uh, Aboriginal township of, of my ancestors and so everywhere you go you know you're walking on land that, that has got blood on it you know and, and a lot of those early settler families their their hands are, are wet with blood on them. There was no recognition of that history at events to celebrate 150 years of Lake County this summer. Descendants of those early settlers still live in the county sometimes in towns named after their ancestors. Kelseyville is named after Andrew Kelsey who enslaved and killed indigenous people and whose death sparked the Bloody Island Massacre. Rob Brown sits on the Board of Supervisors in Lake County. A lifelong resident of Kelseyville, Supervisor Brown took part in ceremonies to celebrate the 150th anniversary. I don't know everything that happened 150 years. The fact that they developed this country, developed the courthouse, developed these towns, people moved here for what it is, yeah, I'm proud of that. As far as, uh, uh, you know, historical stories, lore, myth, those kinds of things. You know, I don't know anything about all that stuff. I wasn't there. I had nothing to do with it. From her window, Rose Brown can see Rattlesnake Island. She lives with her three children on Elam and is concerned about the impact that building on the island will have on them. The idea of building something so large on a, on a piece of land that's so old, that has so much of our history, and I think it's it really impacts our children as far as that we have no rights, that we're not people, that what we say doesn't matter. Um, that all the promises and and the law doesn't really mean anything if you know someone's able to do that because they have the money to do it. Because up until this point, you know, there's many people that owned it, but no one's actually tried to build on it. You know, everyone's always respected the culture, respected the um, traditions, because we we've never our traditions have never been interrupted, um, and so this does put a stress on our community. You're listening to The Struggle for Rattlesnake Island, a special FSRN Thanksgiving Day documentary produced by George Lavender. Stay with us. People on the reservation say, ever since John Nady bought the island, they've been unable to use it as in the past, because he's hired a caretaker to keep people off the land. But Nady and his wife Toby say that they understand the importance of the island to the Elam. We have absolute respect for that land, even though we're not of Elam, you know, ancestry. We couldn't have more respect for that land and wanting to preserve that land. The right of private property in the United States is considered sacred also. There's a number of things that are sacred to one person that's not necessarily sacred to another. And that's the whole issue. And we will but the respect, good news for everyone is res- that we respect the sacred history of And it makes it no people. less sacred. Whatever we do there will we'll make, it, we'll no make it no less sacred. 
From Elam, it's possible to hear the sound of Nady's machinery working on the island, something which Rose Brown says many in the community find painful. We respect the land, and, and I don't believe building any type of vacation home is respecting anything, um, unless he holds vacation sacred in his culture. <laughs> you know, I don't. According to people on the reservation, the island is a sacred place not only to their community, but to many other tribes. Because the community here maintain their traditions, people from across the county still come to take part in the ceremonies at Elam. Rose remembers the first time she was on the island. We had a, a community dance, a fun dance. We called it a shake head dance. And I was three years old, and that was the first time that I'd ever danced. Um, and I didn't know there was going to be a lot of people there, so I was kind of embarrassed. <laughs> you know, we, we grew up learning um, the ceremonies and feeling good about being Native and our spirituality, and so I didn't know a lot of spectators would be there. So I think that was the impact, but also that, that was the first time I ever danced was on the island. So it's... It's a part of me before I was here, and it continues to be a part of me. My grandmother, she would tell us, you know, as, as um, children, that when you participate in your ceremonies, um, you know, specific ceremonies that we have, we protect our three generations to come. That, And I thought as a little girl, you know, what we do here blesses people that aren't even here yet. And then as I got older, I realized we were part of that blessing <laughs> long before we were thought of. Um, what really is disheartening is my children having got that opportunity to be on the land that we're connected to for thousands and thousands of years. Until now, the Elam have maintained many of their traditions on the island, even though they didn't legally own it. As Rose explains, Native people have often had to break the law to hold on to their culture. I'm 33 years old, and, and that's how long it's been legal for us to practice our traditions. Um, in 1978, so when the Indian Freedom Religious Act was passed, and prior to that, um, we'd kept it underground. And my grandfather and my grandmother um, were a big part of passing that tradition on so that one day when they were gone, their grandkids would be dancing. And it's what sustained us in all these years, no matter what we've, we've been through as far as relocation and boarding schools and um, sterilization of our women. There's so many, um, and all the way back to treaties and the gold rush. Um, they said that that's what has kept us, kept us balanced as people is that connection with the creator. And I believe Rattlesnake Island symbolizes that connection to the creator. The last time development plans were made for the island was in the 70s when it was owned by the Boise Cascade Company. At the time, indigenous people had also taken over Alcatraz Island in the San Francisco Bay. Marvin Brown remembers that several families at Elam moved on to the island to protect it. We have a big head dance here that call a big head a ceremony. Never been danced outside the reservation, but we danced it in San Francisco at Alcatraz. You know, when the Indians took it over, and um, I danced the leader at that time. I was a young guy, you know. And so anyway, not later, that either that same year or following the year, they had occupation of Rattlesnake Island. You know? And so I remember we danced, you know, we danced the big head over there, you know. And the big head is kind of like a, it's a connection to the heavens for us, you know. As a result of the occupation, Boise Cascade backed down from developing the island. Jim Brown's family were among the last to return to the mainland. He says the community at Elam has tried for decades to regain legal ownership of the island, but have always felt they've contended with a legal system that excludes them. He points to the Lake County Board of Supervisors as another example of this. Every time we went to court, uh, the white man's law always proceeded for his own benefit over us. And that continues to this day, because the Board of Supervisors' decision basically showed me that. No matter how... uh, uncivil or, you know, guy John Natty could be, I still say it's not about him, you know. To me, he's a perfect example of, of the first pioneers who are like him with the money and the wealth, thinking they, they could do anything they want to anybody they want. At a recent hearing in Lakeport, the supervisors decided whether or not to allow Nady to go ahead with construction on the island. The law doesn't provide any special protections for sacred places, but it is supposed to safeguard significant archaeological sites. At issue was whether Nady was building on a significant site. At the hearings, Supervisor Rob Brown said his decision was based on upholding private property rights. What it's turned into is a referendum on righting a wrong that was committed 150 years ago. And that's not what it is about either. This comes down to 
private property, ownership. Someone owns this property. I get it. Private, private property ownership is not based on seniority. If you own that property today, it's just the same as if you owned it 10,000 years ago. Whoever owns it right now owns that property. And that's just the way it is. That's the way the, the law is. That's just the way it is. This is a house that somebody's getting ready to build. It's not a Walmart store. Archaeologist John Parker has been attending these kinds of meetings for more than 35 years. I've never seen anything like this happen in any of the hearings that I've gone to. He says that the Board of Supervisors made the wrong decision. Another archaeologist was hired to carry out a survey of the area where John Nady wants to build his vacation home. After digging several test holes, Tom Gates discovered chippings left over from making stone tools. But these were never taken off the island to be analysed. So he did his, his test excavations. The landowner would not allow him to take anything off the island. So he was unable to take any of, his, of, any of the cultural material back to the lab for analysis. So the reason that the county hired him was to first discover whether or not there was cultural material at the project area, and secondly, whether that material was significant. Because he wasn't allowed to do any analysis, he couldn't answer the second question. We have no idea whether the area that he studied is a significant part of the site or not. The Board of Supervisors, by issuing the permit without requiring any information about whether that part of the site is significant or not, broke the law. In the end, supervisors voted 3-2 to two in favour of Nady. Chairman Jim Comstock cast the deciding vote. We have heard exhausted testimony on this. Um, and as a native of Lake County myself, I'm born and raised here, I'm as native as anyone can get, it's like Supervisor Brown. I am a huge proponent of private property rights. Comstock's words angered many in the room who got up and walked out. But Jim Brown was not surprised by the supervisor's decision. I was disappointed that the Board of Supervisors didn't represent their constituents, you know, from their districts. And if you go to their districts, most of their people support Rattlesnake Island, not John Nady, you know. And to me, all of them will have private property here. And almost everyone lives on a Native American site, you know, an old traditional Native American site. So I think they look at that as, well, I could protect my, my own, you know, because of this decision. Among those who voted in favor of Nady was Rob Brown. I've worked hard for my property. Most people that, that own property in Lake County have worked hard for their property. Without private property rights, we have no civilization. There was no civilization before private property. There wasn't. There were people that lived, and they operated under, under certain rules and everything that they did, but they did not have incentive to do things because private property is the formation of a, of a civilized country. I don't believe anybody that's uh, alive today um, has been... Uh, has had anything taken away from them, and I don't think anybody alive today has taken anything away from them. Supervisor Brown's office is in the Lake County Courthouse. Above his office is the courtroom, which is where he says the issue of ownership should be settled. That's something which the tribe is considering. Jim Brown says that sacred sites are the least the Elam are entitled to. We're not talking about going to the heart of San Francisco and, you know, chasing a city block out of... You know, these are, we're talking about places that no one is living on, that are still available, because most Indian people would not do that. They, they have respect for people who have lived there, whether it was illegal or not, you know, they still have that respect. Most of our tribes here would say, give us our mountain back, all our islands, and our sacred grounds, and that's all we want, you know. And, and most of that, right now, can be had, because there isn't large populations living on it. While Nady has said that he intends to begin work on his vacation home by next spring, the Elam tribe have pledged to protect their most sacred island. You know, all indigenous people, um, we've been through so many obstacles and, and so much tragedy. You know, part of our spirituality has given us, you know, resilience to overcome all those things. Um, because, you know, what we do affects all of our generations, you know, in the seen world, in the unseen world. Um, that you know the decisions I make will affect my children one day, and, and that's why we stand up for the island, because it's not myself, me. It's about my community and about their survival. Each year, on the day some still celebrate as Columbus Day, others commemorate Indigenous Peoples Day. 
This year, some 150 people joined Elam tribal members to deliver a declaration to John Nady at the offices of his electronics company in Emeryville. My name is Gail Brown, and I'm uh, a Yokeo Pomo from, um, from Mendocino County, and I've been uh, in Lake County um, with my husband and family for the last uh, 38 years. Been enjoying it. Just proud to be a part of the community. Aloni Singers joined the demonstration as it made its way from the Bay Street shopping mall to Nady's office. The Aloni are the indigenous people of the San Francisco Bay Area and have also struggled to protect their sacred places from development. Despite fierce opposition, the new shopping mall was built directly on top of an Aloni burial ground. Jim Brown addressed the crowd. Like I said, today we're, we're going to be making a statement and we're going to present this to uh, Mr. Natty at his... And what it is, this statement declares that we are taking back our Aboriginal rights in the state of California because the state of California did not legally extinguish our rights. And I hope all our other tribes as well step up because every tribe in the state of California could use the same law to get their lands back. We need to get Elam to set the precedent. Gail Brown has many memories of ceremonies on the island something she wants her grandchildren to experience, too. Uh, there's so much that the island has yet for us that it's, uh, it uh, breaks our heart to know that we'll no longer be able to, um, to access any part of the island, um, let alone memories. I mean, it's almost to the point where we feel our memories are being wiped out, you know, being, being taken from us. So it, it means a lot to the people, uh, more than words can describe. It's in our hearts, in our memories, it's in our DNA, it's in every part of us, uh, our lands, especially our sacred lands. These lands were given to us, to our ancestors, and they were told that these were sacred. It's nothing that we determined was going to be a sacred site. It's something our ancestors said. This is what we do here, and Great Spirit blessed us. Across the country, indigenous people are struggling to protect their lands and sacred sites. Many of the other tribes in Lake County have come forward to support the Elam, and Gail Brown hopes others will join them. It's wrong for any um, developer to come in and build on land that is disputed, that is said, this means something to us. And I hope people will wake up to the idea that's, that's not the way to behave today in modern times. You know, that was Old West, you know, coming in and having your way because you have money. To this day, the community at Elam maintains their culture despite everything they have faced. Back beside the lake, Jim Brown makes clear that will continue and that the community will resist any attempt to build on Rattlesnake Island. We basically are committed to not allow that to happen. And so we're going to do whatever in our means to prevent that. Um, unfortunately, you know, like I said, we, um, we don't want to lose anybody, you know, in our community. But um, there are people here that have a lifelong commitment to protect it. So we're going to do that. Today's documentary, The Struggle for Rattlesnake Island, was produced by George Lavender and edited by Shannon Young. Our technical production team at KPFA in Berkeley includes Rose Katapshi, Shauna Ray, and Zane Karizli. Tune in tomorrow for a special on-the-ground look at the drug war in Mexico. Thanks for listening today. In Los Angeles, I'm Dorian Marina.